Americans, this is Dr. Beter. Today is February 28, 1982, and this is my AUDIO LETTER No. 72. On the final Sunday evening of last month, January 31, millions of Americans tuned in their TV sets to watch a special movie on NBC. It was a major production shown in two installments on successive nights. The movie was titled World War III. Viewers were drawn into a snow-swept world of rugged terrain, supposedly in Alaska, at a lonely outpost of the distant early warning radar network, an unidentified blip appeared on the radar screen. As it did so, one crew member, supposedly a Soviet spy, calmly killed all the others, preventing an alert signal to NORAD. The blip turned out to be a Russian transport which dropped a team of Arctic commandos onto the frozen Alaska wilderness. As the plot unfolded, it turned out that the Russian commandos were there to sabotage the Alaska oil pipeline. They had been sent to Alaska by Kremlin hardliners who thought that they could use the sabotage threat to undo an American grain embargo against Russia. Instead, the plan failed, leading finally to simultaneous orders by both sides for a nuclear first strike. During those two evenings of an imaginary build-up to World War III, a surprisingly realistic atmosphere was created. There were many technical inaccuracies, but they hardly mattered. What did matter was the emotional impact of the movie, and on that level it was very effective. Here in the United States there is a growing fascination with violence, bloodshed, and war. More and more of our entertainment is built around themes of hostility and destruction. This trend is visible in sports, in music, in literature, in motion pictures, and in television. It seems as if we have been too well off for too long in terms of material things. We have a restless craving for change. My friends, what seems to be happening now in America was expressed long ago by the Spanish writer and philosopher Don Miguel de Unamuno. During the latter part of the 19th century, Unamuno kept a secret and mostly spiritual diary at his workroom in Salamanca, Spain. His last full entry was made in January 1902. Seventy years later, the diary was discovered and published, first in Spain and later in an English translation here in America by the Princeton University Press. The Unamuno Diary, titled The Tragic Sense of Life in Men and Nations, seems as relevant today as if it were freshly written. Unamuno wrote, and I quote, Men seek peace, they say, but do they really? They are also said to seek liberty. Not at all. They look for peace in time of war and for war in time of peace. They seek liberty under tyranny, and tyranny when they are free." My friends, these few words of the Spanish philosopher Unamuno seem to describe America today. There has not been a war on American soil except for Pearl Harbor in the memory of any living American, and we have possessed freedom for so long that we take it for granted. So now we are blindly following leaders who are betraying us into the ultimate in both war and tyranny. My three special topics for this AUDIO LETTER are Topic No. 1, Nuclear War Fever and Expanding Secret Warfare. Topic No. 2, The Third Space Shuttle Challenge to Russia. And Topic No. 3, The Shortening Timetable for Nuclear War 1. Topic No. 1. Day by day the pitch of war fever is rising steadily here in the United States. Every night on the television news, turmoil in Central America is a leading topic. In El Salvador, a government that continuously violates the human rights of its own people is being propped up by the so-called Reagan administration. The El Salvador situation contains the seeds of another Vietnam, in spite of White House lies to the contrary. Like the ill-fated South Vietnam, El Salvador is riddled with corruption throughout the government and military. In both cases, this situation resulted from CIA tampering with each country's power structure. 
Two decades ago, America started wading into the Vietnam quagmire by way of secret groups of advisors, so-called, unknown to the American public. And today the same thing is underway in El Salvador. We're told that there are only a handful of non-combatant advisors there. That, my friends, is a lie. As of now, there are already more than 300 Green Berets in El Salvador, with more on the way. We're also hearing sharp words from the White House directed at Nicaragua. Over five years ago, I gave a warning about Russia's rapid progress in gaining influence there. But at that time, America's rulers were trying to save their crumbling secret alliance with the Kremlin, so they said not a word to the public about Nicaragua. Today the secret alliance is long gone, so today we are hearing years late about Nicaragua. Overseas, too, the clouds of approaching war are growing darker and darker. In the Middle East, Israel is threatening a major invasion of Lebanon, which could not fail to lead to war with Syria. The American Bolshevik Zionist war whirlpool is continuing to spread outward from its source, Israel. Two months ago, in AUDIO LETTER 70, I gave an alert to watch for new turmoil in Iran to erupt shortly. Now Iran is back in the news, right on schedule. There have been new bombings in Tehran, a reminder of the prospects for civil war there. At the same time, we are hearing reports that the alleged Ayatollah Khomeini is ill and may die soon. Once again, that is a lie as part of the grand plan to manipulate us into war. The real Ayatollah Khomeini was killed and replaced with a devil two years ago this month, as I reported in AUDIO LETTER 54. When the American Bolshevik war planners here in the United States are ready to play their Iran card in the war buildup, we'll be told that Khomeini has died. United States connected Bolshevik agents in Iran are poised and ready to stir up civil war there. As the situation worsens, we'll be told that Russia is preparing to turn Iran into another Afghanistan. Already, Chief United States Arms Negotiator Eugene V. Rostal is making statements to help pave the way for all this. Lately, he has been quoted to the effect that Russia can be expected to test us, quote-unquote, over Iran. Once again, America's Bolshevik military planners are preparing to use Iran as one key to their elaborate nuclear first strike plan against Russia. Their military strategy is an updated version of the plan I detailed three and a half years ago in AUDIO LETTER 37. The determination of the American Bolsheviks here to go to war against Russia is becoming evident in other ways, too. One arena is that of the supposed nuclear arms reduction talks in Geneva. As a grandstand play, the entity President Reagan has proposed the so-called zero option to eliminate all nuclear weapons in Europe. It sounds good, but it has no substance. In the actual negotiations to figure out how to carry out this plan, the United States has made no practical proposals at all. In response, the Russians have made two counterproposals during recent weeks. One would begin by freezing nuclear weapons in Europe. That starting point may not be ideal, my friends, but at least it's clear-cut and possible to do. Washington's response was to ridicule the idea. The other Russian proposal was made just a few days ago. It's for both sides to completely halt all manufacture and testing of all nuclear weapons as a starting point for general disarmament. For the moment, the White House seems to have been taken off guard. Soon, though, you can count on the fact that this idea, too, will be rejected with some excuse by the United States. Because, my friends, nuclear disarmament is the last thing our American Bolshevik rulers here want. Instead, the government is now publicizing its intentions to prosecute youngsters who fail to register for the draft. The entity Reagan is talking out of both sides of his mouth about the draft. He keeps telling us that there is no intention to actually bring back the draft. But on the other hand, we're now told that anyone who fails to sign up for the draft may be bundled off to federal prison. At the same time, civil defense has become a hot new topic of promotion by the so-called Reagan administration. The agency which is spearheading this drive is relatively new, having been lifted straight from the pages of the secret new Constitution for America. It's called the Federal Emergency Management Agency, 
or FEMA. FEMA is doing its best to lull us to sleep about the dangers of nuclear war. The agency says, for example, that, quote, the United States could survive nuclear attack and go on to recovery within a relatively few years." Unquote. FEMA is planting articles in newspapers nationwide to drive home this comforting lie. These planted articles try to tell us that all we would have to do is to evacuate our cities, learn a little survival training, and fix up some simple fallout shelters, and we'll all do just fine. My friends, these articles planted by an agency of the Federal Government are the worst kind of lies. Just one H-bomb exploding on one major city would overwhelm all the hospitals of America with grisly casualties. But our leaders want you to believe otherwise, so that you will follow them into a suicidal war. Recently, George Kennan wrote an article which expressed very well the state of mind of those who now control America's military policies. Back in the days of the secret Rockefeller-Soviet alliance, Kennan was one of the proponents of the policy of containment of Russia. Now the situation has changed radically, and in the New York Review of Books for January 21, 1982, Kennan wrote an article titled, On Nuclear War. Kennan said, quote, there is no issue at stake in our political relations with the Soviet Union. No hope, no fear, nothing to which we aspire, nothing we would like to avoid which could conceivably be worth a nuclear war." Unquote. And further on he added, quote, This entire preoccupation with nuclear war is a form of illness. It is morbid in the extreme. There is no hope in it, only horror. It can be understood only as some form of subconscious despair on the part of its devotees, some sort of death wish, a readiness to commit suicide for fear of death." Unquote. My friends, Kennan could not be more accurate in describing the state of mind of those who now control America's military plans, the American Bolsheviks here. Ever since Russia's military takeover of space in late 1977, military planning here in America has taken on a kamikaze mentality. It's the concept of victory through suicide. I gave details about this new suicidal streak in our military planning in the summer of 1978 in AUDIO LETTER No. 35. It is this hopelessness that led to America's shift to a first-strike nuclear strategy against Russia, which I first reported in AUDIO LETTERS No. 36 and 37. The American Bolsheviks, who now hold the reins of America's military, are satanic and schizophrenic in their thinking. They are opposed to everything that our Lord Jesus Christ stands for, truth, hope, and love. They live by lies and deception and they are afflicted by utter hopelessness and self-hatred. They do indeed have a death wish, and they want to take the rest of us with them. As war fever is building for public consumption, the secret war is continuing to escalate. Last month I reported on Russia's renewed geophysical warfare, involving especially weather modification and artificial earthquakes. These things are intended to reduce America's ability to go to war. Canada, too, is being drawn into the American Bolshevik war camp, and recently parts of Canada have suffered such extreme blizzard conditions that a national emergency was declared. I also reported on two incidents in which Russian cosmospheres triggered plane crashes last month. I can now add something very important to that report. The rash of strange plane crashes that began with Air Florida Flight 90 on January 13 involved more than just a general warning from the Kremlin. They were in direct response to a specific act of secret warfare. For over four years now, Russian electrogravitic weapons platforms called Cosmospheres have been hovering high over the United States. They first announced their presence by creating giant air booms along the East Coast and elsewhere. Since that time, their numbers have multiplied, and they patrol continuously over all kinds of American strategic target areas. When war comes, the American Bolsheviks here plan to shoot down as many cosmospheres as possible using high-power lasers. 
I reported this at least three years ago in my AUDIO LETTER REPORTS. Until recently, however, it's been very hard to detect cosmospheres floating overhead. They're invisible to normal radar except at very close range. But now one of the crash weapons projects here in the United States has made it easier to detect cosmospheres and to aim lasers at them. The new technique called Computer Enhanced Infrared is an extremely sensitive means of detecting the heat radiation given off by cosmospheres. It's known by the acronym CEIR, pronounced SEER. On the evening of January 12, 1982, a complete operational test was carried out against a cosmosphere which was patrolling high over central New Jersey. SEER was used to aim a ground-based high-power laser at the cosmosphere. Then the laser was fired. A section of the cosmosphere erupted into blue-green flames. As the flames started to spread, the crew accelerated the cosmosphere toward the coast. All cosmosphere crews are under strict orders to make certain that their craft never fall into non-Russian hands, and they were making for the sea. The stricken cosmosphere trailing blue-green flames was seen over a large area of eastern Pennsylvania and central New Jersey. It had been hovering at an altitude of more than 40 miles, but it came down fast. Its semi-rigid shell started crumpling. It passed over Atlantic City at low altitude and plunged into the water just a few miles offshore. Many witnesses watched as the remains of the cosmosphere burned, floating on the surface of the water for nearly ten minutes. The whole incident created a sensation in the local region, but official government spokesmen have treated it all as a non-event. This very first downing of a cosmosphere created shock waves in the Kremlin. It was decided very quickly that a clear message should be sent to the Pentagon that they would pay dearly if the incident should be repeated. The Russians knew that a laser had shot down their cosmosphere. So the very next day, an Air Florida flight with laser warfare specialists aboard was caused to crash here in Washington. Then came a string of crashes and near crashes, all of them supposedly unexplainable. All four Air Force Thunderbird demonstration jets were made to crash, as I explained last month. A Boeing 737 in California dropped far below its flight path, seemingly without cause, and narrowly missed disaster as it clipped some power lines. And strangest of all, a Japan Airlines DC-8 crashed into Tokyo Bay during the final moments of its landing approach. It was a perfect flying day, clear and sunny. A DC-8 was only 1,000 yards from touchdown, flying in a gentle glide. There were no mechanical problems. Suddenly the pilot acted as if he were dazed. Reportedly he reached over and reversed thrust on two of the four jet engines. The big jet nosed downward. It smashed into light stanchions marking the approach path and crashed into the shallow water. Later in the hospital, the pilot said he had blacked out. The co-pilot reportedly said he too suddenly felt woozy, but fought it and remained conscious. My friends, there's not time to go into the full details of all of these incidents. It's enough to say that in every case, including the Japanese crash, the targets were chosen to convey a crystal clear warning to certain people. In every case that I have mentioned, a Russian cosmosphere used a neutron beam weapon to bring about these strange results. As I've explained before, neutron beams disrupt electronic instruments and also the mental and nervous systems of people. The Russians are saying to the American Bolshevik Pentagon, in effect, if you shoot down any more cosmospheres, there will be no place to hide. The secret war is growing more and more intense as we get closer to the outbreak of all-out war. At the same time, the alignments of powers, great and small, are continuing to shift and settle into place. Last month in AUDIO LETTER 71, I reviewed in some detail the three main power factions in the world today and the relationships among them. One faction is that of the Rockefeller Cartel, 
the multinational complex of big oil, big banking, and big business. Another faction is the Bolshevik Zionist Axis, with headquarters shared between the United States, especially New York City and Israel. The third faction is that of the new rulers of Russia, who have expelled most of the Bolsheviks formerly in power there. Last month I reported that a new operational relationship is in the works between Russia's new rulers and the Rockefeller cartel. I can now report that as of now the emerging quid pro quo falls far short of the secret alliance that used to exist. Instead, it's basically an agreement not to damage one another as a matter of deliberate policy. The prime objective is to free both of them, the Russians and the Rockefeller cartel, to deal with their mutual enemy, the American Bolsheviks, who have infiltrated key policy-making government positions here in Washington. The main area in which the Rockefeller cartel can be helpful to the Russians is in the economic sphere. The American Bolshevik-dominated foreign policy of the United States is a policy of economic starvation against Russia and her satellites. The Rockefeller cartel is in a position to partially blunt these policies by cooperating with Russia and East-West trade. American Bolshevik economic warfare against the Soviet bloc is most apparent right now in the plight of Poland. The American Bolsheviks here finally succeeded in using the Solidarity Labor Union to push Poland into martial law. Now martial law itself is being used as an excuse to make the Polish people suffer even more at America's hands. A thinly disguised food embargo is in place by the United States against Poland. Even chicken feed is being held back in order to create disaster for Poland's own chicken farms. Everything possible is being done to drive the Polish people to such desperation that open revolt will erupt. The collapse of Poland poses a military threat to Russia and is an economic drain as well. Russia's new rulers are working with an unwieldy centralized economy left behind by the expelled Bolsheviks. It cannot be changed overnight. So the Russians are vulnerable to economic warfare. In order to avoid economic disaster, the Russians are pushing hard for new ways to raise hard Western currency. Last month I reported on one of these Russian moves, a major coup in United States Treasury securities. But for the long term, the Russians want to establish more stable and mutually beneficial economic ties with the West. The centerpiece of Russia's economic drive now is the Siberian gas pipeline for Western Europe. It's a $25 billion project, the biggest ever between the Soviet Union and the West. It will be completed in 1984. The Bolsheviks here are trying to completely stop the gas pipeline project, but the Rockefeller Oil and Business Cartel is trying to help the pipeline project go ahead. Earlier this month, on February 17, the United States Chamber of Commerce a long-time Rockefeller public relations organ, went public about the pipeline. It called the Reagan embargo against pipeline equipment a strategy of economic warfare against Russia. Just last week, the Joint Economic Committee of Congress endorsed the pipeline project. And in Europe, American multinational oil companies are lining up in support of the gas pipeline. All of them, that is, except one, Mobile Oil. Unlike the other members of the Rockefeller Big Oil Cartel, Mobile Oil in West Germany has been publicly opposing the gas pipeline. To the Russians, the gas pipeline is a matter of economic survival. And with all-out war on the horizon, the Kremlin has no patience with those who say one thing and do another. The Russians regard Mobile's position against the pipeline as a double-cross, in effect siding with the Bolsheviks here in America. Russia's rulers decided to give Mobile Oil strong reasons to rethink their position, and fast. On Thursday, February 11, the Russian container ship Mechanic Tarasov departed from a port in Quebec, Canada, bound for Leningrad. It headed northeast up the St. Lawrence River, then out through the Gulf of St. Lawrence into the Atlantic. After skirting the south coast of Newfoundland, the Tarasov set course east by northeast. Its course was chosen to take it very close to the world's largest semi-submersible oil rig, passing it on the south.
The rig was the Ocean Ranger, operated by Mobile Oil. It was supposedly unsinkable like the Titanic. The Tarasov, like many other Russian merchant ships, possessed a military capability that was not admitted. As it neared the giant oil rig in a mounting storm, it launched a homing torpedo with a low-yield nuclear warhead toward the rig. Just before 1 a.m. Monday morning, February 15, the torpedo reached its target, one of the giant underwater pontoons. Nuclear explosions underwater are far more confined than those in air, and this one was hidden by the hurricane-force winds and pounding waves. A hole was blasted in the pontoon, and the Ocean Ranger started settling toward that side. The crew gave a trouble call by radio. Half an hour later they reported that they were manning the lifeboats. But the Japanese-built Ocean Ranger was designed to be the world's most unsinkable oil rig. A corner of the upper platform dipped into the water and then stopped. The rig stayed afloat, listing at a crazy angle. The roughnecks stopped boarding the lifeboats, hoping the boats would not be needed after all. Then a cosmosphere hovering high above the rig took aim at the corner of the rig which had dipped into the water. A powerful blast from its charged particle beam weapon blew a hole in the partially submerged corner. Immediately the Ocean Ranger heeled over and sank. It went down so fast that it was too late for lifeboats to be launched successfully, and all hands were lost. The freighter Tarasov continued on course after sinking the oil rig. The Russians expected that the freighter would be long gone before anyone figured out what had happened, but they miscalculated. At around 2 p.m. that same afternoon, Monday, February 15, an American attack submarine was closing in on the Tarasov. The sub fired a single torpedo at the Tarasov, hitting it broadside. Water surged in through a giant hole below the water line, and the freighter started sinking. Like the crew of the Cosmosphere that was shot down over New Jersey last month, the crew of the Tarasov had strict orders to protect the secrets of their ship. And so the Russian captain refused assistance from a nearby Danish freighter as his ship sank with its secrets. Apparently, my friends, Mobile Oil got the message. Just two days after the sinking of the Ocean Ranger, Mobile Oil shut down the other two oil rigs, which had been nearby, and towed them ashore. But our leaders still have not gotten the message. They are still leading us straight into Nuclear War One. Topic number two. Early this month, on February 5, the entity Vice President Bush made himself conspicuous by a trip to Cape Canaveral, Florida. He was photographed with astronauts inside the European-built Orbital Science Laboratory called Space Lab. According to official schedules, Space Lab will be put in orbit by Space Shuttle in late 1983, about a year and a half from now. Meanwhile, Bush announced that Space Shuttle Flight No. 3 is now scheduled for March 22, 1982. Supposedly it's to last for a full week. For public consumption, NASA spokesmen are continuing to pretend that the shuttle is merely carrying out a leisurely series of test flights. We are told that the Space Shuttle program is basically a peaceful civilian program in spite of the all-military crews flying the shuttle. But the peaceful image of the Space Shuttle program is a total lie. The fact is that the Space Shuttle flights now underway are part of a crash program by the United States to regain a military toehold in space. The United States has been virtually locked out of the military use of space by Russia since late 1977, as I have reported in detail in the past. Russia's domination of space for the past four years and more has been highlighted by numerous manned space flights. These have even included cosmonauts from nine other countries besides Russia. Meanwhile, the United States went more than five years without admitting to any manned space flight attempts. The Russian long-duration space spectaculars in Earth orbit have been sufficient to build Russia's prestige in the public eye. But as I reported in the past, the Soviet space program involves far more than is being revealed publicly. Ever since mid-October 1977, the Moon has been a Russian outpost. 
There are seven manned long-range particle beam installations on the near side and at least one base on the far side. In the past, I've reported that regular missions are flown to and from the moon in order to resupply the bases and rotate crews, and slowly but surely the Kremlin is inching its way toward breaking the news about its control of the moon. Don't expect them to tell you everything, but they are beginning to drop hints about it. An example appears in the Russian publication circulated in the United States called Soviet Life for this month, February 1982. On page 33 of the magazine there is a brief one-page feature on space. Planted near the beginning of the article are the words, quote, Today spaceships shuttle between the Earth and the Moon with greater frequency than did the first voyages to the New World." Unquote. At the top of the page there is a nighttime photo of a moon ship ready to blast off from a Russian Cosmodrome. Below is a picture of the Earth as seen from space, and in between is a statement in bold type designed to give another hint about their moon flights. It says, quote, From a distance of 70,000 kilometers above the Earth, the planet looks peaceful and even defenseless. The common goal is to protect our blue and green home." Unquote. My friends, satellites are not used at altitudes of 70,000 kilometers. The highest orbit that is generally useful for Earth satellites is the geosynchronous orbit for stationary satellites over the equator. 70,000 kilometers is almost twice that far from the Earth. The only time when a spacecraft reaches that far from the Earth is when it is on its way to or from the Moon or another planet. Russia's interest in space also extends far beyond military factors. In AUDIO LETTER No. 38 I describe the plans of Russia's new rulers for the colonization of our solar system. Those plans are moving ahead steadily. In fact, at this very moment not one but two Russian spacecraft are approaching the planet Venus. They are said to be unmanned, but, my friends, they are manned spacecraft. In AUDIO LETTER No. 38 I reported that the Russians had settled on Venus, not Mars, as the first target beyond the Moon for experimental colonization. They first started landing unmanned craft on Venus some seven years ago and they have learned some key facts not yet known in the West. Four years ago the Russians began a series of increasingly long-duration manned orbital space flights which were widely publicized. These were gradually extended to six months and more to learn how well crews would stand up to interplanetary space travel. Early last fall these long-duration orbital flights were completed. The Russians had learned everything they needed to know. Last October 30 and November 4, 1981, two Russian spaceships blasted off for Venus. Both ships are manned by Russian cosmonauts, and both are preparing to land on Venus as I say these words. My friends, the comparison between the space programs of the United States and Russia today is a study in tragic ironies. We Americans are being told that the Space Shuttle is primarily a civilian-oriented project, but it is actually military. We're being told that it is the world's first reusable spacecraft, but a shuttle is actually being lost on every flight. We're being told that the Space Shuttle has put us years ahead of Russia, but we have actually slipped years behind. We're often told that our rulers want only peaceful activities in space but they are shutting down almost the entire civilian scientific space program. Funding is continuing for one or two peaceful projects which are too visible to cancel without an uproar, such as the Space Telescope, but follow-on projects to explore our solar system are being lopped off and discarded because they contribute nothing to our leaders' plans for war. We're told constantly that the Russians have nothing but war and conquest on their minds, but it is the Russians, not we Americans, who at this moment have two teams of spacemen preparing to land on Venus. 
They are going there for reasons which have nothing to do with war. The Russians are exploring the Solar System simply because it is there. Russia's new rulers believe that it is man's destiny to move into space. The urge to explore that motivated their Viking ancestors of old is alive and well today in the Russian space program. My friends, I believe that same spirit is still strong also among the American people today. Why else would our leaders have to keep selling the space program to us as a great adventure? But the Bolsheviks here who now control America's space program do not care about adventure or exploring the unknown or inspiring the human spirit. They care only about power, control, intrigue, revolution, and war. And their plans for war are shaping America's Space Shuttle program. Twelve days ago on February 16 the Space Shuttle was moved out to the launch pad at Cape Canaveral, five days ahead of schedule. This will be America's third Space Shuttle launch, and it is also the third shuttle that is being used. The first shuttle, the real Columbia, was destroyed last April as I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 64. It was replaced by the Training Shuttle Enterprise, which landed at Edwards Air Force Base and was taken to Florida. The Enterprise flight last November was a stopgap measure, while a third shuttle could be extensively modified. The new shuttle now at Cape Canaveral is one of the three secret shuttles from White Sands that I mentioned in AUDIO LETTER No. 63 last spring. It has undergone extensive modifications since the first Space Shuttle disaster ten months ago in April 1981. It still looks the same as the original Columbia, at least from a distance, but this shuttle is actually far, far different. The shuttle now on the pad, my friends, is armed to the teeth. The basic mission of this third shuttle is the same as that of the first shuttle nearly a year ago. One year ago today in AUDIO LETTER No. 62 I described in detail what the Space Shuttle was supposed to do. Its payload was a heavily armored, laser-firing robot battle station designed for space reconnaissance over Russia. Russian space weapons finished destroying all of America's spy satellites nearly four years ago. That means America's war planners will be shooting almost blind at Russia if they start a war without somehow acquiring new reconnaissance data. The Space Shuttle is trying to solve that problem by getting the new hardened satellite into orbit. That is what the Space Shuttle flights right now are all about, attempts at reconnaissance. After each shuttle takes off from Florida, it follows a long, swooping, curved launch into the north in order to fly over Russia. The American Bolshevik military planners here believe that if they can once get their new Super Spy satellite into orbit, it will do the job. They are confident that it can survive any attacks by Russian space weapons long enough to radio back a large amount of reconnaissance data, and once they have that, the Pentagon will be ready to take America to war. Last spring the Columbia was destroyed before the spy satellite could be deployed. Likewise, the makeshift Enterprise mission in November was a failure, but the military shuttle planners believe it will be a different story with their Shuttle No. 3 now preparing for launch. In the cargo bay of this shuttle there is a new robot reconnaissance battle station like the one I described in AUDIO LETTER No. 62. There is also an additional laser mounted in the forward end of the cargo bay just behind the crew compartment. It is a hydrogen fluoride gas dynamic laser mounted vertically aimed upward. It is equipped with a swiveling head consisting of mirrors that can aim the beam around a wide range of angles. The hydrogen fluoride laser in the cargo bay is intended mainly to protect the shuttle why it climbs toward orbit. As I reported in AUDIO LETTER No. 64 last spring, the Columbia came under fire shortly before it reached orbit. Intelligence analysts here eventually obtained enough information about what happened 
to decide on installing the cargo bay laser. As the shuttle climbs, the air will grow thinner and thinner, dwindling to almost nothing long before the rocket engines shut off. At the earliest possible moment, the modified cargo bay doors, which have no hinges on this shuttle, will be blown off by special explosive devices. As the cargo bay doors flutter away from the shuttle, it will leave the upper half of the bay wide open. The cargo bay laser will be ready to fire from that moment onward. It's equipped with the same system called SEER that I described in Topic No. 1. Since a laser equipped this way successfully shot down a Cosmosphere last month, the Shuttle planners believe the Shuttle will reach orbit safely. Once in orbit, planners here believe that the main threat to the Shuttle will be Russia's orbiting Cosmos interceptors. These manned killer satellites are responsible for sweeping the skies clear of American spy satellites. In order to deal with that threat, there have been truly radical modifications to the Shuttle. Whenever the Space Shuttle is discussed, it's always emphasized that Shuttle astronauts can work in their shirt sleeves. No need for space suits because riding in a Shuttle is almost like riding in an airliner. Not so this time, my friends. When Colonel Jack Lausma and Colonel C. Gordon Fullerton lift off in this Shuttle, they will be in space suits. What's more, they will be depending on their space suits because their crew cabin will not be pressurized. The whole lower front portion of their ship below the flight deck has been turned into a weapons bay. As soon as the Shuttle reaches orbit, the nose will open up to the vacuum of space. The nose will fold downward and back, somewhat like certain cargo aircraft whose noses fold upward to load and unload. As soon as the nose opens up, a complex laser system will emerge. The system has five tubular sections aimed up, down to each side, and straight ahead. Each laser tube has a swiveling mirror head for beam aiming like that of the cargo bay laser I mentioned earlier. Once deployed, the nose laser system will be able to fire in almost any direction. The only exception is a narrow corridor to the rear of the shuttle. The nose laser system is described as a nuclear pumped helium plasma laser with five resonators. The nuclear power pack can fire any one of the five laser tubes at a time. It's not as powerful as the cargo bay laser. But unlike the cargo bay laser, the nose laser system can operate for a long time on an intermittent basis, and the Shuttle planners believe it will be powerful enough to disable the manned Russian killer satellites. Under the protection of the nose laser system, Lausma and Fullerton are to deploy the robot spy satellite. As soon as it is deployed, they are to return to Earth in a small Gemini-type re-entry capsule. This part of the plan is the same as I revealed a year ago for the first Shuttle flight. Meanwhile the Shuttle will remain in orbit. The nose laser system is programmed to keep right on zapping any Russian Cosmos interceptors that come within range. It will continue doing so until it is destroyed or the nuclear laser runs down, which could be a very long time. It will constitute a very dangerous nuisance in space, and the Russians will have little choice but to destroy it. The American Bolsheviks here hope the Russians will lose a lot of spaceships and men before they succeed in doing so. If the military shuttle planners are right in their calculations, the third space shuttle mission could turn into a battle royal in space. If they are wrong, they presently plan to try again one more time. As of now, the fourth Space Shuttle mission is scheduled for the 4th of July. After that, no matter what happens with the Space Shuttle, they are now planning to go ahead anyway in setting off Nuclear War 1. Because, my friends, the American Bolsheviks here have scored an intelligence coup against Russia. Topic No. 3 For nearly a year now, I've been reporting on the grand strategy of the American Bolsheviks and their Zionist partners to set off nuclear war. Their basic plan 
is an updated version of the one that was successful in setting off World War I. The prelude to that war involved ever-widening uncontrollable crises in the Balkans. Likewise today, the whole world is being Balkanized by means of Bolshevik Zionist intrigues. Last year I began warning that we would soon be seeing more and more simultaneous crises in the world as the fever for war rises. Today these simultaneous crises are now upon us, right on schedule. El Salvador and the rest of Central America are aflame with internal upheaval. Poland is under martial law. While America tries to transform Poland's troubles into a complete bloody disaster, in the Middle East not one but several time bombs are almost ready to go off since spring is coming. These are the things I was talking about in my advance reports last year. The Reagan-Bagan axes of Bolsheviks and Zionists intend to manipulate these crises and more to come to pave the way for war. Suddenly certain crises will combine to trigger a chain of events leading to Nuclear War I. The Joint Military Junta of the United States Pentagon and Israel are working on a fast timetable for all of this. As I reported in past tapes, they are aiming for mid-summer 1982 this year for the final war sequence to begin. This will involve regional conflicts in the Middle East and elsewhere, which gradually escalate to engulf the superpowers. The whole thing is being set up to make nuclear war appear unavoidable. At last all-out nuclear war itself will break out between the United States and Russia. It will be made to appear accidental, but as I have detailed in the past, my friends, Nuclear War I will actually begin with an American nuclear first strike against Russia. Up to now the secret war planners here have been expecting that it would take many months for the final war build-up to run its course. For example, a Mideast war might be triggered this summer of 1982, but it could take until the spring of 1983 for the resulting nuclear war to erupt. That has been their thinking until very recently, but a drastic change is now taking place in the secret war planning underway here in America. The timetable for Nuclear War I has now been speeded up by many months. My friends, as of now the new target date for an American nuclear surprise attack on Russia is mid-September. 1982. That is little more than six months from now. The reason for this drastic shortening of the war timetable is a major intelligence coup which has been scored by the American Bolsheviks here. Two high-ranking Soviet generals have recently been spirited out of Russia and brought here to Washington. These two men are Bolsheviks whom Russia's new non-Bolshevik rulers failed to detect and weed out. In intelligence parlance, they remained as moles in Russia's military apparatus. Now they have been brought to America, and they bring with them a wealth of data about Russia's current military posture. Thanks to these two former Bolshevik Soviet generals, the secret war planners here now have enough information to plan a nuclear strike against Russia. If they can refine that information from data from Space Shuttle Flights Numbers 3 and 4, so much the better. But if neither of the next two shuttle flights is successful, the war planners intend to wait no longer. They want to make use of the intelligence obtained from the two Soviet generals while it is still fresh, and so the secret war planners here have now set a deadline for themselves of mid-September 1982 to attack Russia. As it stands now, my friends, Nuclear War I could erupt at any time after Space Shuttle Flight No. 4 this summer and well before the end of September. My friends, I am telling you these things not to panic you, but for the opposite reason. I want you to be able to understand events for yourselves 
so that you can take action to protect yourselves and your families. I cannot emphasize strongly enough that what I am reporting to you are the plans of men. If you see certain things happening, you will know that these war plans are succeeding and that war is imminent. If you do not see certain parts of the plan happening in the news, then you will know that the war plans may have hit a snag of some kind. In that regard, I also want to let you know about the biggest of all possible snags that may soon trip up the American Bolsheviks here. For some time now I have been reporting on the hidden struggle for power that is dividing the United States Government. On one side are the American Bolsheviks, whose chief government operative today is Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger. On the other side is the Rockefeller Cartel, whose chief governmental spokesman is Secretary of the State Alexander Haig. Weinberger and Haig are constantly at each other's throats in the news. This is only a pale shadow of their intrigues behind closed doors. Caught in the middle is the puppet entity President Reagan. Our puppet President was installed by the Rockefeller Cartel, but has been largely under Bolshevik control ever since the assassination attempt last March. Like a marionette, he dances according to whatever strings are being pulled at the moment by either side. As of now, America's military is dominated by the Bolsheviks here, but that was not always so. The Rockefeller Cartel has been regaining power and is now preparing to try to regain control over the military here. As long ago as 1963, Rockefeller Insider set up a contingency plan for an eventual military coup d'etat against a puppetized President. I revealed the existence of the plan five years ago this month in AUDIO LETTER No. 21. Early stages of the plan were actually set in motion against then-President Carter, but events later that year caused the plan to be aborted. Now the plan for a Rockefeller Cartel-backed military coup is being set in motion again, and this time it is a crash program intended to be carried out within a matter of months. As I detailed in AUDIO LETTER No. 67, the Rockefeller Cartel cannot afford to let their Bolshevik enemies here succeed in setting off nuclear war. Therefore, the military coup d'etat must take place before the American Bolshevik surprise attack against Russia. If possible, the coup will be carried out before the fourth Space Shuttle flight this summer because war will be possible any time after that. The man who is in charge of the military coup preparations is a four-star Army General. That is unusual because coups are usually carried out by lower rank officers, but this time the circumstances are very unusual too. The General in charge of the coup to come, my friends, is General Alexander Haig, presently Secretary of State. He is looking forward to the day when he can really say, quote, I am in charge here, unquote. Lately Haig has been on major TV programs almost daily. He has also been traveling almost continuously to help pave the way for the coup d'etat to be accepted abroad. Most importantly, the Russians were informed of the impending coup during the Hague-Gromyko talks last month. Part of the new quid pro quo between the Rockefeller Cartel and the Kremlin has to do with the coup being planned here. The Rockefeller Group were afraid that the Kremlin would interpret a military coup as a sign that an attack on Russia would follow quickly. Haig has assured the Russians that this will be an anti-Bolshevik coup and that the Bolshevik war plans will be terminated. Gromyko was very dubious in his talks with Haig. He expressed fears that the whole plan will backfire and cause the American Bolsheviks in the Pentagon to push the button, but Haig finally extracted an agreement that the Russians will not interfere with the coup nor use the opportunity to attack the United States. What is brewing now, my friends, is really a counter-coup. Three years ago the Rockefeller Cartel lost its power over the United States Government in a Bolshevik coup d'etat. I detailed those events at the time, 
but otherwise it was generally hidden from public view. Now the Rockefeller cartel is trying to take back the power they lost three years ago. If the military takeover does take place, it too is likely to be largely hidden in its details from public view. Only one event in the plan is likely to be visible to all. That event, my friends, will be the sudden death of the entity known as President Ronald Reagan. If that happens by the end of summer 1982, no matter what the official story may be, you will know that the military coup d'etat has taken place. On the other hand, should something happen to Secretary of State Haig by that time, it could well mean that the Bolsheviks have foiled the coup. It is all a race against time, my friends, and the stakes in this race involve nothing less than the very survival of our United States. Now it's time for my last-minute summary. In this AUDIO LETTER I've had no choice but to dwell on the subject of approaching war, nuclear war. Nuclear war fever is conditioning us for war, and hostilities are escalating in the secret war already underway. While two manned Russian spacecraft are approaching Venus, America's space program has dwindled to a last-ditch military stab at space. The war timetable is being speeded up with nothing in sight but a military coup d'etat to stop it. The situation we face today, my friends, reminds me of a course in military justice which I took in law school in 1950. It was taught by an Army General. He started the first class with a statement that is still ringing in my ears today. He said, If you remember nothing else from this course, make no mistake about one thing. The United States of America was born in war and the United States will die in war. Until next month, God willing, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.